Um, now we move on to our third example, uh, and this is an example of free expansion, which is a kind of expansion that we haven't considered yet, but let me explain what it is. Suppose I've got gas in an isolated system, like this. But I put some kind of barrier in this system. Draw it in blue. I put some kind of barrier into this system, which holds all of the gas on one side of the box. So I start off like this, and suppose I'm at temperature P1, volume V1, sorry, pressure P1, volume V1, temperature T1. Okay, now I start like this, and for a free expansion, at some point I suddenly remove the barrier. So the gas is contained, and at some point I suddenly, in a negligible amount of time, remove this barrier, and therefore the gas will expand to fill the space. So this is a very rapid expansion. And suddenly remove barrier. Okay. And after I remove the barrier, we then go into the state where the if you wait long enough, you go into the state where the gas has filled now the whole box, okay, and it's at pressure P2, volume V2, temperature T2. So I want to say, how does this initial state relate to the final state? Well, if we suppose that this is an ideal gas, then, well, we, it's thermally isolated, right? It's thermally isolated so that no heat has gone into the system through this process. Also, I do no work in removing the barrier. Okay? The gas does no work because the gas is pushing this way, but I'm removing the barrier at 90 degrees to it, to the force of the gas. So no work is done by the gas or done to the gas. So work done is also zero. Okay. And this means that in a free expansion, the change in the internal energy of the gas is equal to zero. So in a free expansion, there is no change in the internal energy of the gas, because you don't heat it, you don't do any work to it, or it doesn't do any work. Okay. Now, for an ideal gas, we know that the change in internal energy is just number of particles times the constant volume heat capacity times the change in temperature. So if there's no change in energy, there must be no change in temperature. So therefore, delta T is equal to zero. In other words, T1 equals T2 equals some temperature T. <coughs> that means that as long as this gas is ideal, the initial and final states are the same as if this gas had expanded isothermally. It started out in a state of temperature T, it ends up in a different state at the same temperature. So it's the initial and final states are the same as for an isothermal expansion. The initial and final states are the same as for the isothermal expansion.
which we calculated already, delta S is N K B log the ratio of volumes. Now in this case, it expands, so V2 is greater than V1. So this is greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, and therefore the process is an irreversible process. Change in entropy is greater than zero, so the process is an irreversible one. It, when you think about it, it makes sense that this process should be irreversible, because what have we done? Well, we started off with the gas in one half of the box. We remove the barrier, and the gas fills the whole box. Okay. The gas left to its own devices will never go back into the original half of the box. So while you can allow the gas to expand, the gas will never choose to be compressed to half the size of the box again. If I want to go from this state to this state, I have to physically do work to compress the gas. In other words, this is an irreversible process. You can go this way in a closed system, but you can never go that way. Okay, I want to finish this example with a final note. In the other kinds of expansions I've talked about, I've talked about adiabatic expansions, isothermal expansions, and so on, we always drew them on a PV diagram. So, for example, this is the isothermal expansion here. Temperature T. Temperature T. So you might ask, well, what does the line of a free expansion look like? Okay. If I do a free expansion and I try and draw it on here, what does it look like? Well, the free expansion is a type of expansion which you can't draw on a diagram like this. So it's not possible to draw the free expansion path on a pressure volume diagram. The reason is, as this gas expands, the pressure and the temperature is not a constant throughout the gas. This is true because pressure and temperature are not constant throughout the gas. Okay, I want to do one final example before we finish. And this is an example of a re reversible process, so one where it is possible to go both ways. It is called a quasi-static. I'll explain all these terms later, by the way. Quasi-static isothermal expansion. of the ideal gas with a reservoir. So let me draw a picture to say what I mean. It's similar to pictures I've drawn before. I have the gas in a box, thermally isolated box. I allow the volume of the gas to change through a piston, which is also thermally isolated and has a constant force applied to it, which controls the pressure of the gas. And I control the temperature of the gas by putting a reservoir, which has a fixed temperature T. Okay. So I've got the gas here, 
the reservoir which controls the temperature of the gas and the piston which controls the pressure of the gas. Okay. So as it expands, heat will go from the reservoir into the gas. So this is what we do, we slowly, slowly is a very important word here, we slowly reduce the force F on the piston so that the gas and reservoir are always at the same temperature okay so this is a closed system if I consider it consisting of a reservoir and a gas and if we do it slowly we can assume that roughly the reservoir and the gas remained at the same temperature T and in this case we will see that the process is reversible it's possible to go both ways so first of all what's the change in entropy of a gas well, this is an isothermal expansion, which we've seen many times before. Okay, let me write down the definition. Integral Q over T, which is N K T log V1, V2 over V1. So this is just the isothermal result we've seen before. Now if I look at what's the change in entropy of the reservoir, RES always stands for reservoir, then this looks very similar, except the heat going into the reservoir is minus the heat going into the gas. If I call Q the heat going from the reservoir to the gas, then the heat going from to the gas, going from the gas to the reservoir is minus the Q, right? So this is exactly the same integral as that, except with a minus sign, so the result is exactly minus nkv log v2 over v1. So in an isothermal expansion, a slow isothermal expansion with a reservoir, the change in entropy of the gas is minus the change in entropy of the reservoir, and therefore the total change in entropy is zero. Total change in entropy, which is equal to the change in entropy of the gas plus the change in entropy of the reservoir, this is equal to zero. And because the total change in entropy is equal to zero, this means that you can go both ways. So this is an example of a reversible process. So this is our first example of a reversible process and we did it by assuming that the gas is in contact with this reservoir and we change the state slowly. It's very important that we change the state of the gas slowly. If we change it quickly, that means we allow the gas to expand quickly, then the temperature of the gas will drop. If the temperature of the gas, gas drops, then the temperature of the gas is lower than the temperature of the reservoir. And in this case, we've seen that the process is irreversible. Okay. So if you want it to be reversible, you have to do it so slowly so that the two systems always remain at the same temperature. If you do it fast, they create a temperature difference. And this means that you get a positive increase in entropy, which you can't undo. Okay, so this defines basically what our quasi-static processes, if you want to do a process in such a way that it's reversible, you have to do it infinitesimally slowly, infinitely slowly, so that the components of the system are always in perfect equilibrium with each other. So this defines what's known as a quasi-static process. Okay. 
So the state of the system changes very slowly. Very slowly. But the components are always in thermal equilibrium. And it's only these kind of processes which can be reversible. Only these very slow processes can be reversible. So if you want to make a process where there's no change in entropy, you have to do the whole thing very, very slowly. You have to move the piston in the gas very slowly, for example. Okay? Now, in reality, there are no processes like this. Okay? In the Stirling engine I showed you last time, the piston goes up and down fast. Okay? In a car engine, the piston goes up and down fast. So, in practice, there are no reversible processes. In the real world, everything is irreversible. In reality, there are no reversible processes. So this idea of a reversible process is a theoretical one. We can theoretically make reversible processes where we do it very, very, very slowly, but in reality, there is always some increase in entropy. No matter what you do, there is always some increase in entropy. So all thermal processes which occur in nature are irreversible. They can only go one way. And this is really the, the state of the world as we know it, right? Every action you do has some effects which are irreversible. If I just walk as I've been walking and talking, okay, some of my energy is dissipated as friction when my foot hits the floor. This friction generates heat. This heat increases entropy. So just as I walk, I am doing an irreversible process. I'm increasing entropy. As I talk, the sound is energy coming out of my mouth, right? This Energy is also dissipated as heat. It sets up vibrations in the air. This warms up the air. So my speaking is also irreversible. I am sending out sound energy, which is turning into heat. This is irreversible process. It's impossible to undo. So in reality, all of the processes which we undertake every day are irreversible. They can only go one way. Note the second law. The first point I wanted to make, which I don't think I made last time, the second law tells you that entropy is always increasing with time. This means it makes a distinct, it, make, it makes a distinction between time going forwards and time going backwards. If you're going forwards in time, the entropy is increasing. If you're going backwards in time, the entropy is decreasing. So this is called um, time reversal asymmetry. The physics looks different depending whether you're going forward in time or backwards in time. Right? And it's the only source of time reversal asymmetry in classical physics. If you look at electromagnetism or you look at, say, Newton's laws, they all have time reversal symmetry. That means Newton's laws look exactly the same as whether time is going forwards or backwards. There's no distinction between the future or the past. But the second law does make a distinction between the future and the past. Because it says, if you're going forwards in time, entropy is increasing. So the second law is the only 
source of time reversal asymmetry in classical physics. Now, when you go to quantum field theory, there are other sources of asymmetry, but these are not particularly relevant to the microscopic world in which we live. Okay? So this time reversal asymmetry means that the past is different from the future. Distinction of past and future. And this is a very important thing to note because from our perspective as human beings, the past and the future are completely different, right? We, we have a memory of the past. We know what happened in the past, but we don't know what will happen in the future. We know that certain processes, like I talked last time about dropping a glass, only work in one direction. If you drop a glass and it smashes, it will never reform into a glass of its own accord. So all of these are examples of the time reversal asymmetry, the distinction of past and future. But physically, the only source of this asymmetry is the second law of thermodynamics, is the behavior of entropy. And the second point I wanted to make is I stated the second law of thermodynamics is saying entropy is always increasing. But you can state it in various other ways which are equivalent. So equivalent statements of the second law. Okay. So the first one is the one that I stated. So it says that ds by dt is always greater than or equal to zero in a closed system. So if your system is closed, the entropy must always increase. That's the way I stated the second law in this course. The second statement is known as the Clausius statement. Clausius was a scientist in the 19th century. And he said, this is equivalent to saying, if I have two bodies, one which is hotter and one which is colder, then the heat will always go from the hotter body to the colder body. So it is impossible for heat to flow from cold body to a hot body without doing some work on the system. So we talked about systems which do transfer heat from a cold body to a hot body. For example, a, a refrigerator does exactly this. But what the second law of thermodynamics says is you have to do work. So when you use a refrigerator, you have to use electrical energy. And this statement is saying that it's impossible to build a refrigerator which does not require energy. Heat will only naturally, of its own accord, flow from hot to cold. That's the statement. Okay, there are two more statements I want to say before I finish. The next one I will call the Carnot statement because it refers to Carnot cycles, not because it was stated by Carnot. The Carnot cycle is most efficient and the efficiency of the Carnot cycle is given by 1 minus the ratio in temperatures. And finally, this is what's known as the Kelvin statement, which are all, is also equivalent. This says that you can't get work out of heat alone. So if I have a very hot system, I can't get 
work, I can't get the energy in a useful form out of that system without putting it in contact with the Kohler system. So it is impossible. to extract work from a system no work from a system I need to be more precise it is impossible to extract work in a cyclical fashion from an isolated system <coughs> at temperature T without connecting it to a system at lower temperature. So I made this point in the very opening lecture when I showed you the working of the Stirling engine. The Stirling engine works because there's a difference in temperatures. Okay. If the temperature is the same throughout the Stirling engine, then it's impossible, it doesn't work. There's no way you can get useful energy out of the system. Now, this applies no matter how hot the system is. So if I take a system and I heat it up to 100 degrees or 1,000 degrees, or a million degrees, if there's no temperature difference within that system, you cannot get work out of it. Even though at a million degrees there's a lot of energy there, you can't extract it. You can only extract it by putting it in connection with the, temp with the system at lower temperature. So as an example of this, when I was at university, one of my friends, he was from Thailand, and you know Thailand is very hot, so he was asking me, thinking in terms of natural resources, the thing that they have in Thailand is lots of heat. They've got a, it's a very hot country. So he asked me, is there any way that we can use this heat to generate energy? Right? We've got a lot of heat, can we use it to generate energy? And unfortunately, the answer is no, because of this. Okay? If you have a hot system, you can't get useful energy out of it, unless you connect it to a cold system. So heat alone does not allow you to extract energy.